Great, so welcome back everybody. Um, really excited about these next two presentations. Uh, this immediate one, uh, we're gonna be talking about successful in-person events. So events that actually took place in real life in 2020. And we're gonna hear from three panelists. So how we're gonna do this is each panelist will have about 10 or so minutes to talk about what they did in 2020. And then we'll open it up to questions afterwards. We'll obviously filter questions that might need to be addressed immediately, but we'll try and hold those until everyone's spoken. So first up we have Lance. Panaguti, uh, the owner and co-founder of Without Limits Productions. And, you know, he used to be a professional triathlete, and I know some folks might be upset about that, but, but he can handle a bike. Um, he and his brother started Without Limits really to help bridge the gap between beginner-focused events and the elite amateur racing. And since 2008, the, the company grew to 60 events across the country, so Colorado and the East Coast. And they offer really a diverse lineup of events, you know, from multi-sport to running to road cycling and cyclocross, some great cyclocross races here in Colorado. And their mission within the post-COVID world remains the same as prior, and that's to produce events that treat the endurance scene as, as one community of athletes. So Lance, go ahead and take it away. Yeah, thanks, Tara, for the introduction. And out of those 60 events that we produce, last year we produced about five. And all five were in the cyclocross space. And really, I mean, we kept canceling race after race throughout the season. And it wasn't until late June, July, when a lot of permitting agencies and towns were, were even willing to talk about special events. And a, a lot of the answers that I give are very specific to Colorado. So that's where the five events that we were able to produce we're all located. So when I talk about kind of state restrictions, everything is what came out of Colorado Department of Public Health. And the way our season kind of went was we didn't know if we'd have a cyclocross season till probably the second week in August. So a lot of the guidance that was coming down from Colorado Department of Public Health was event capacities that were restricted to right around 175. But the biggest problem we faced last year that we're trying to mitigate going into next year was cycling was kind of the forgotten child when a lot of the COVID dial restrictions were coming out. So when we go to talk to a, a permitting agency, they were grouping cycling and endurance sports, running triathlon in with recreational sports, soccer, football. So a, a lot of the restrictions we were looking at were, all right, how many people can we have on the playing field at a time? And it wasn't until kind of halfway through August that they finally broke out endurance sports to where we could have 25 athletes at the start line and at the finish line. Then the next big hurdle going into the season was we hadn't announced anything. And typically we're announcing registration, event dates, three to four months out. So we said, all right, sat down with the staff and said, if we're going to move forward with this, there's two things we're looking at. One, can we get things permitted? And two, what's going to be the athlete reaction in terms of all of the restrictions that we're going to have to implement? Is it going to be worth it? And the biggest thing we kind of learned was talking to the health departments, they didn't really have a lot of guidance or answers. It's almost like they were kind of waiting for event directors to tell them how to interpret the state guidance. So for instance, we dealt with, out of those five events, four different health departments, all four of those different health departments were looking at the state guidance at the time and interpreting that 175 and that 25 on the start line number completely different. And it, it was almost like the left hand wasn't talking to the right hand at the time. And, and finally, I use Boulder as an example. It, it took probably two weeks of right up until the end of August to finally get them to look at that 175 number for a total event capacity as a rolling number. Fortunately, with cyclocross, we've always dealt with a long day. It's always been an eight and a half hour race day. So the way we structured things was, okay, we're gonna have no more than 175 on site at a given time, and that included volunteers. The only thing excluded from that number was staff. So we broke out all our categories, we looked at a normal race day, and we said, all right, can we work with that 175 number? In the best system we came up with, was we took all the larger categories, Cat 4 men, some of your master's groups, 40 plus Cat 1, 2, 3, 40 plus Cat 4. Some of the groups that have traditionally been 50 to 70 people in the past, we said, all right, if those groups were 25, 
what's our total event number for the day? And is it even financially worth it? And the result was no, we, we were going to lose thousands of dollars to raise with an event that was 200, 300 people max. So what we did was at least for cyclocross was we came up with a heat system. So based on your USAC ranking, we took a category like 40 plus cat four men and said, all right, if there's 75 people signed up, we created heats of three and each heat started 30 seconds apart. So we created zones with fencing at the start line where those 25, they had their USAC ranking, they had their heat assignment before the race, they went to their zone, they lined up. So there was no crossover between groups of 25 out there racing. The only crossover that could have occurred was out on course. So those groups started 30 seconds apart. They all had timing chips on. And then we merged the timing chip data at the end of the race for one consolidated result sheet. It, was it a perfect system? No. But did we get any athlete pushback? Not a single negative email. And, and I think that's kind of important to preface this whole presentation uh, when we put out all our restrictions for the season, having to wear a mask to the race, no spectators was probably the biggest one that will carry over to this year. No vendors. And we're worried about that with cyclocross because so much of that sport is inherently all about hanging out after the race, the mingling, the club aspect, the post-race party. And there was none of that. And there was not a single negative email from anyone. They were just grateful to be showing up, putting a number on and racing their bike. And after those five races, we had to cancel the last two when the second spike occurred, but it helped open the door for a lot of the conversations we're having this year going into road cycling season. Uh, we're taking that COVID mitigation plan that's actually on the USAC website that was help, uh, coordinated in conjunction with our local association and all of those same health departments and municipalities that we're working with. And you know what, this worked well last year uh, under much more restrictive unknown circumstances, and they're willing to readjust things and give more guidance for cycling now than before we had in any. And Tara, I don't know if you have any specific questions, but as we go into this year, one of the things that in the conversations I've already had with towns like Boulder County, Denver, is they're reworking the COVID dial. And I don't know if that's in a lot of different states, but I can say for Colorado two weeks ago, they already reworked the COVID dial. So a lot of counties are moving in terms of reopening faster than expected. And Lance, maybe you could tell us what, uh, what you did last year that, that didn't really work. And then um, I know when you and I spoke, we, we talked about what you did in 2020 that you put in place because of COVID, but you'll take away when we're back to normal? It's the biggest unknown right now. I'd say the biggest thing we talked about was it was pre-registration only, just because we had to have all the athlete data for contact tracing, which fortunately we never had to implement. We never had one positive case come out of the five races we did produce. Each race total event capacity was between 400 and 500. So our numbers were strong, unfortunately, not a single positive case. But being pre-registration only alleviated so many problems and just made race day so much smoother. It's something my staff after the season said, wow, can we do this every single year? And what does that look like? Would athletes actually adhere to it? Because at least last year, the system showed that people are willing to pre-register and take that risk of potentially having something come up in their life and losing that registration. And we're fortunate where we had multiple events. So people who did call the day before that were pre-registered and some life event came up, we were able to move their registration to another event. I know a lot of events are just one-off races and don't have that same setup, but we definitely are maintaining in a post-COVID environment for cyclocross and even the road cycling races, can pre-registration only work? And what are the benefits to the athletes? Because it made things go so much smoother for our officials and for our timing crew. And Lance, what did you do for refund requests for the last event of last year? Are you gonna roll them to an event for 2021? So when we did have to cancel, that's one of the things we did have a COVID waiver. A, a lot of those athletes actually emailed us and donated their entries, the few that we had. So as we move into this year, we basically have a disclaimer on every road race, 
that says, hey, if we have to cancel for anything COVID or weather related, your entry automatically rolls to next year. But what we've done is we've kind of taken the current capacity restrictions as we've opened up registration and just kept everything super low. So right now, all our springtime events are capped at 25 per group and total event capacity is a little bit restricted. And as things start to reopen, we'll bump up those caps. Great, thanks. So if anyone has any questions uh, for Lance, just uh, hold them off till, till we get through everybody else's presentation. So we'll switch over to Joan. So most of you know Joan. Um, she is currently the executive director of the Valley Preferred Cycling Center. And prior to joining the team at T-Town, she was here with us at USA Cycling as the vice president of event services. So probably knows the majority of you. And prior to that, she was the marketing manager for Avis North America. She was also a partner in the US Grand Prix of Cyclocross and one of the members that brought the first Cyclocross World Championships to the United States back in 2013. And her goal at T-Town is, is to really strengthen community programming, create great, great racing opportunities for local, regional, national, and international athletes, and a pretty good, big goal of achieving 50-50 male-female participation by the 50th anniversary of the track in 2025. Um, and you can follow along with a hashtag of 50-50 and 50. And um, Joan, I'll add that to the, to the chat window for everybody to follow on your social media accounts. Thanks. Yeah, so uh, nice to see everybody. It's kind of fun because I'm seeing all my old friends. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, after a year of being locked in my apartment on work from home, it's really nice to see everybody. Um, and yes, much, much, uh, much like Lance, we, we, uh, we had a lot of the same similar, um, similar experiences. And, and Tara, I don't know if you want to throw up the slides or if you just want me to talk through them myself, but um, we, we are, you know, different than most of you in that we're a venue, we're a building. Uh, we are considered a sports arena um, and we run a full season. And so the things that we were worried about and had, had concerns about may be very different from, uh, from what you would do if you were doing just a single event. But I think there are our takeaways. Um, and we were really fortunate as, um, as, as, we're sponsored by a major hospital network and a, and a major local PPO, right? So we are the Valley Preferred Cycling Center. Valley Preferred is actually um, a physician's group and a PPO. And I had a meeting with them. My cat is about to make his debut, just so y'all know. Um, <laughs> there he goes. Um, and uh, I had a meeting with them on February 2nd. Thanks, Chuck. Um, and on February 2nd, we had just started hearing radio reports about this weird thing coming out of, uh, coming out of, out of Asia that might be a problem for us. So we, we had this meeting that said, oh, you know, um, we were talking about sponsorship and talking about plans for the season, but then we're like, hey, did you hear that news story on the news this morning about this, this COVID-19 thing? And we were lucky that we got a very big heads up early from our hospital partner that it could potentially go in a bad direction. Uh, so I feel like we had almost a month's jump on folks. Um, and I remember very distinctly, and my, my colleague Kelly is on the, on, the, uh, on the call as well. I'm sure she remembers, I came into the staff meeting and I was like, you guys, we're gonna have a problem. Um, and we need to start thinking now about how we pivot if this goes bad. Um, and so we were very fortunate in that we did have a bit of a jump um, on, on planning for it, but still um, we had, like, much like Chuck, we had no clue how bad it was going to get. Um, but that said, we were able to, to have a very successful summer season at T-Town. And you're seeing uh, this, this slide here, our opening slide is just a, a photo of um, what you were greeted with at T-Town when you showed up to uh, train or uh, race this summer, um, this very aggressive signage plan. So Chuck, if you can um, skip ahead. Um, I think what we learned, the biggest takeaway for us last year uh, was we created a really strong reliance on, on partnerships, um, that communication with the partners, with the county and with our community was the most important thing that we could do. Uh, we also learned to work with what we got. Um, we got, we had to get creative. Um, you know, we are used to running a big international meet in June. We're used to running 
three days a week of racing, a ton of programming, in addition to having like an incredibly robust training schedule at the track. Um, and suddenly those things were gone. And what were we going to do uh, when, when we had very, you know, stringent limitations? Um, and then I think the other really big piece that, that somebody else spoke to earlier was enforcement um, to create confidence in our community that coming to the track every day, they were going to be safe because they knew we were going to be enforcing what we said we were going to do. Um, and then all I can say is it was details, 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 and that all pivots back to point number one, which was that strong reliance on partnerships. So if we hop ahead to the next slide, um, you can see that um, our, our partnerships, much like Lance working with, with BRAC and, and, uh, and Chuck uh, and Boulder County, we worked uh, really, really closely with Lehigh County. Uh, our, our property is actually owned by Lehigh County. We're a tenant of the county. Uh, we, we operate the stuff at the track, but the track is really owned by Lehigh County. And so we were responsible to the county to operate, you know, holier than the Pope, as my boss liked to say. Um, they were invaluable in helping us interpret the governor's mandates. Um, and they worked with us really closely on the details of how to reopen and stay open. Uh, and as, the, as we moved through the phases of reopening, um, they helped us figure out where to play as those state guidelines changed. Uh, I mentioned before Lehigh Valley Health Network and Valley Preferred, um, being sponsored by a major hospital system in a pandemic is pretty helpful. Um, I, will, I will say um, they provided insights and advice um, and assistance with best practices that also, I think, helped us create an environment that made our participants feel safe. Uh, really valuable. They provided us with guidelines for youth programming because we run a ton of youth programming at the track. Um, and so they were able to create guidelines. They work with every sport. Um, they, they work with football and soccer and, and all the ball sports, but they also work with our athletes. And so they created really robust guidelines that we were then able to, to provide to our athletes and say, hey, these are, this is the rule book you got to follow to play the game. Um, and then we also got a lot of great insight on how to lay out the venue, traffic flow, et cetera. Um, and then the, the third leg of that stool was USA Cycling. And I cannot tell you how much I valued every one of the, the seminars that Tara and Chuck put on, but also the private conversations we had offline um, and you know, just following their great leadership on implementation and really getting inspiration for the modifications that allowed us to open safely. Um, so looking ahead, you know, we have, um, I mentioned it earlier, you know, we run not just racing, uh, we, we run tons of programming. We run, you know, we're, we're a venue that's typically open to the public. Um, if we don't have programming, it's an open park. It's open to the public. And um, we had to adapt to what we, were, what we were given. And what we were given was a county that said, we're gonna let you reopen because you have a fence around your building. And that fence around your building enables you to control it. So when we first reopened, other sports fields and other athletic areas um, were not allowed to reopen. And they were very insistent that it was that control of the venue that enabled us to do what we did. Um, so I sort of, you know, on the next slide, I, I've sort of got it headlined as work with what you got. Well, I was, I was given a, a venue that's a sports arena. So we had a restriction in the venue of 25 people um, at a time uh, total. That included staff, coaches, and athletes. And so we had to pivot and we had to create stuff and ways of bringing people in and out of the building uh, that worked with what we got. It was, a, it was a sports arena that was limited to 25. So you can see here, we did programming in this picture. It was programming for youth, um, but you know, it was for youth and parents. It didn't exceed 25. Uh, everybody was sitting six feet apart. Everybody was masked. Uh, and this was a, this happened to be a concussion seminar with our uh, hospital partner um, because we could still bring them information in an outdoor setting safely. So we just started pivoting on everything. Um, I mentioned that normally open sessions, you know, training is open sessions. Just, you know, you rock in with your bike and you ride and you leave. Um, 
we couldn't do that. So we closed every gate to the track uh, and we required pre-registration for every time training slot. Um, so if you wanted to train at 10 a.m., you had to pre-register on Bike Reg for the 10 a.m. training slot. It was capped at a certain number of people. Uh, you were in at 10, you were out at 11.30. The next round came in, we had a half hour to clean the venue in between and we just flowed people through all day long. And speaking of things that will carry over for the future, what we discovered was things like motor pacing sessions and elite training sessions got a whole lot safer broadly speaking, when pre-registration was required. So that's something that we thought, oh, this is actually a great improvement. We're gonna carry this forward into the future. And yes, will we make every training session require pre-reg when COVID is not a thing anymore? No, we'll relax that, but boy, we will keep it for some of those sessions where it made sense to have that control over the venue. So that was a really great takeaway. Um, and again, much like Lance, everything was pre-reg, right? It was online pre-reg, so it was signed waivers, signed COVID waiver, signed venue waiver, signed USAC waiver, um, all done online, no touch, low touch, um, and it was, it was great. And that was something that I had wanted to implement at T-Town when I first got there because it was always pay cash at the window, get your number, go race your bike. Um, but then as a result, we had no athlete database when I got there. Um, so in addition to the great um, contact tracing database, which is you know why we really forced the pre-reg in addition to the low touch, now we have a database of all of our athletes and we've been able to have all these great learnings about who actually comes to our track. Um, and one of those great learnings of what we came from the track is that at, at T-Town right now, we're 70-30 male-female participation, which is really great. I mean, it's, it's bucking a lot of national numbers, but that's where 50-50 and 50 came from. It's like, all right, if we're 70-30 now, we're gonna, we're gonna bump to that 50-50 uh, by the 50th anniversary, that's a goal. And we only reached that goal because of what we learned with the data we got during COVID. Um, so it's actually this amazing takeaway from, <clears throat> from a, a pivot that we had to make. So Chuck, if you could bump forward um, another, yeah, thanks. Um, so we mentioned uh, the cap on the venue, um, pre-reg only. Um, we had to revamp how we even brought people into the venue. So we had to come in the front gate, you had to go out the back gate, it was one-way traffic. Um, that assured that everybody went through the screening process. It assured that everybody had their temperature taken. It assured that, you know, um, that everybody was checked in. So we knew that they were pre-reg. So you came in one way, you went out the other. It was all very safe and flow. Um, we also, because of contact, uh, the six foot social distancing, we ended up moving people out of the infield, um, which is a weird thing at a track, right? You're used to warming up in the infield. You're used to hanging out in the infield um, when you're between sets or when you're between races. Uh, and we had to push that all out into the parking lot. And so what we did was we created everybody's little bubbles out in the parking lot and it actually became this really eat for warm-ups right so people are out on their on their rollers in the parking lot instead of in the pens right on top of each other in the um in the venue and it, it kept people safe it made people feel like they were in their little race bubble um and it it took the pressure off the infield for keeping people at distance. So that was a great innovation that we will hopefully not have to keep going forever, uh, but it certainly helped us pivot and it addresses some of the things that Dr. Rashawn talked about, which is that the danger is not necessarily on the bike, the danger is in the off the bike time. And if we could sort of blow out the amount of available space to keep people apart, we felt that that really helped us create a safer environment than if you ever be close together in pens in the infield. Um, so uh, we also revised the staging. So we kept our officials all over the place, right? So we, uh, we moved folks around so that the officials felt safe, um, which is a re was really important to me. You know, um, we felt really lucky that our officials came out to officiate uh, week after week and uh, we wanted to make them feel safe and comfortable about that too. Um, Chuck mentioned that in PA, we had an outdoor mask mandate for racing. Um, so we would have, we were, we were red, yellow, green in Pennsylvania, um, for the phases of reopening and in yellow, we were preparing to return to mass start racing when on July 7th, we went to green. 
And two days before we went to green, the governor said, yeah, no, if you're outside of your home uh, and cannot consistently maintain six feet of social distance, uh, masks have to stay on, which also applied to mass start racing. So we would have had to race um, mask like Colleen Gulick did with her, her pickle juice criterium series. And if you've ever been to T-Town in the summertime, it's about 110 degrees in the crater. And we thought, now we can't make people race mass start races in masks, they'll die. Uh, it's just too hot in the crater. Um, and so we pivoted to time trials only, um, which was not what we wanted to do, but it turned out to be wildly successful. And we sold out every Saturday on, on, our, on the days that we ran time trial programming. Um, and it was turned out to be brilliant. And, uh, <laughs> it was fun and people enjoyed it. And um, we also implemented electronic timing and scoring. So if you've been to a velodrome before, you've probably seen after uh, you know, the heats are posted, you know, everybody gathers around a board where everything's posted, results are then posted. Um, and we said, no, can't do that. So we pivoted to only electronic timing and scoring. Uh, no, no posting of results anywhere, but everybody could look at their phone and in real time have their lap times um, and they could see where they where they placed. And so that was another amazing takeaway for us was this pivot to to having electronic timing and scoring for everything. Uh, that is something that we will carry forward 100 percent. Like we will have. Uh, we will have that live track timing for every event moving forward um, from now on because it was just such a, a brilliant addition to what we do. Um, we had to pivot and create goals to keep people coming back to these time trials week after week. So at the end of the season, we dangled an age group best performance, a national record day and a track record day. Uh, and it gave folks something to train for all summer long. And so they kept signing up for those training sessions. They kept coming to the track. They kept coming every Saturday to race. And we felt that maintaining that sense of community would serve us really well next year. I think a lot of a lot of promoters that I've spoken to are worried. Hey, you know, we didn't have cyclocross here this year. And a lot of people here learned that, hey, it's, it was pretty nice having my weekend back and not standing out in the cold and the mud, you know, in late November. Um, and I was really worried about that. I was worried that people would, would not, they would lose the habit of coming to the track if we didn't offer something. So we very aggressively tried to keep our, our community in the habit of coming to the track and staying connected to the thing um, and not losing that habit and that connection of racing bikes, but do it in a really super safe way. Uh, and it, I, I feel like it, it really worked pretty well because if you look ahead to the next slide, um, we broke numerous track records. We had a, a national record uh, break and fall, I, I should say. So it was, um, it was uh, it was really successful. People bought in. That that was the most important thing. People bought into the new model, and I think if you think creatively and try to give people an experience where they feel good and happy and healthy, they, they do buy in. Particularly if you communicate it really aggressively. Um, and the other really big upside of these pivots that we did was it allowed us to keep providing the value to our sponsors. Um, so, for example. Ocean Spray was a new sponsor for us in 2020, and they were supposed to set, sponsor our Saturday series, and they had big plans for our Friday night series, and if we hadn't done those time trials on Saturdays, we would not have delivered for our brand new sponsor, Ocean Spray, but as, but as a result of the pivot, we were able to provide that value to them. Um, they're renewing for this year, which is amazing, um, and they really felt that they got the value out of that sponsorship, even though it wasn't what they signed up for. Um, so that was really the, the power of that, uh, just that work with what you got. Uh, <laughs> um, and so, you know, then uh, we also had to pro pro pivot on all of our programming, right? The, the normal bicycle racing league that we run for kids had to become a skills clinic. It was under limited enrollment. Chuck, this is on the next slide. Um, instead of offering uh, our normal junior programming, we offered specific TT practices because we knew that that was what we were going to be um, 
able to offer, right? So instead of doing a, a mass start kids clinic, we did uh, junior TT practices. Um, we kept running our Women's Wednesdays programming uh, with a focus on skills development instead of mass start racing. And then we started rolling in for them too, how to, how to max out their performance in the TTs. So we just pivoted all of the, the programming um, around, around what we were able to do. Uh, and happily people played played ball. Um, and like I said, class sizes were limited, but we were turning people away, um, which sucks, right? You never want to turn people away. Uh, but it said that there was still an appetite to come out and race bikes. Um, and so I, you know, I felt pretty, uh, pretty great about, about that. Um, talked about being really transparent. Chuck, if we hop to the next slide. Um, we had highly visible signage everywhere. Um, Kelly Bertoni, anywhere that people had to stand in a line, <laughs> Kelly made big yellow six foot markers everywhere. Um, you can see we did temperature checks for everybody coming into the venue. Um, we had a screening questionnaire. We had uh, updated the governor's travel restrictions at the venue. Um, I mentioned the control access to the venue. You could only come in one way. And once the session, once it was 15 minutes past the start time of a session, the gates were locked, nobody else could come in. Uh, we had very aggressive cleaning policies, um, online reg, online waiver, pre-reg, electronic timing, no touch, low touch, no communal food or drink. Everybody was told, uh, you know, you gotta be self-sufficient, bring your own. Uh, we didn't even use our loaner bikes. Um, and in the cases where we did, the same bike was the same to assign to the same person for the whole summer. So, um, you know, normally we would just be like, yeah, here's the bike from the barn. Um, but no, there was, you were assigned a bike and that was your bike for the summer so that you weren't getting cross contamination. Um, but we were very strict. And I can tell you on more than one occasion, um, I watched Kelly chase people out that hadn't gone through the screening and she was very, very good at her job. And that's what it took to, to really make sure people kept their masks on when they weren't up on the track and they, um, and they, they behaved. And, um, but yeah, it took having staff and full-time staff, you know, really pivoting their normal jobs, roles and responsibilities to taking temperatures and screening and, saying hey pull up the mask like we, we we had to enforce it but then people felt safe so um yeah that was that was uh it was it was a tough summer but i think it was really well worth it and then finally if we look ahead to the to the learnings um we learned that digital mattered a lot um, so we launched the Talk of the T-Town podcast, which has enabled us to stay connected to our community um, and provide additional sponsor value. Uh, B. Braun became a sponsor of the podcast instead of our corporate challenge. Um, we featured doctors from our local hospital. Um, we featured athletes. We featured folks from USAC. Um, but digital mattered. Um, in the spring, we were offering Facebook Live cycling classes with with notable coaches so that we could keep that connection to the community when we couldn't be together at the track. Um, we are hoping that programming is gonna resume in April uh, and we know our venue restrictions have eased. We're allowed greater capacity, so we're not stuck at 25 anymore, but we don't know what the mask requirements are going to be. Um, so we're hopeful that, you know, much like Dr. Rashawn said, there's evidence that you're perfectly safe on the bike to be unmasked. And so we're certainly hoping to provide evidence to our county representatives that say, hey, look, the, the science supports that you're safe when you're on the bike without the mask on. And, and hope that we're allowed to then proceed without um, the masks during competition. If the mask mandate holds, we'll start with TTs and then hope that the numbers continue to move to a point where we can do mass starts. But we feel like we've learned how to do it now if the masks are still required um, so that this season will be less bumpy. Um, like I said, once COVID is over, we're not gonna keep requiring pre-registration for all the training time slots, but we're certainly gonna keep it for some. And we will 100% keep pre-registration only for racing because it is really, as Lance said, uh, just so valuable from a contact tracing standpoint, but also just from a, 
knowing who your racer data uh, perspective is. Um, so we'll stay low touch, no touch. Not having to have paper waivers is the most brilliant thing ever in my book. Uh, those, those electronic waivers are a joy um, for me and the planet, I'm sure. Um, and we're gonna keep the electronic timing and scoring going in real time because it is such a, a it's a big expense. It's a huge expense to, to have electronic timing and scoring three days a week. I mean, it's a big expense, 100% uh, worth the investment. So there, there you have it. That's, a, that's what we did at the Velodrome and uh, I'm happy to take questions. Um, I see a bunch coming in, um, so yeah. There, there you have it. <laughs> Great, thanks, Joan. And so I will jump in with one question. Um, someone was curious how the live track timing worked and whether you used an outside vendor for it and if you'd be willing to share who that was. Yeah, Tom Maines. Um, <laughs> Tom Maines did our uh, timing and scoring, his, um, his, his timing company, and we will continue to use him. Um, I, I think Tom is probably here. He was, yeah, there he is. Uh, Tom is here, so he can talk a, bit, a little bit about that, I'm sure. But yeah, Tom was uh, an incredibly valuable partner for us at the track this summer. Great, thanks. And there's a couple of questions that um, I wanna ask the three of you. So let's get into Tobin's presentation and then I'll throw these questions at each of you since Joan, you're very specific to a venue and Tobin and Lance, you, you deal with more outside events. So let me introduce Tobin here. So many of you know Tobin Belling. He, uh, he's been with the sport for a really long time since 1998. He's either been involved with promotion or officiating and um, he's, he's in that magical number of about 400 bike bicycle race events, and those are mostly on the mountain bike side. And some of his favorite highlights of those include promoting five UCI cross country races. Um, he's also served on the Texas Mountain Bike Racing Association as president and vice president for 18 years. And after 20 years of leading several internet startups, um, so if you need any help with any uh, computer stuff, Tobin's your guy. Um, he's now retired uh, and joined us here in Colorado in Telluride, where he is a ski instructor and also owns a vacation rental company. He does currently serve on the board of directors for BRAC, which is our USA Cycling Local Association for here in Colorado. So Tobin, go ahead and uh, let us know uh, how your event went last year. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Tara. Uh, in the chat, I've just put up uh, a page that has all of the bullet points that I'll be talking about. If you wanted to bring that link up in your browser, you're more than welcome. Uh, the first picture up top there is um, racer Erin Huck getting her temperature checked prior to packet pickup. Erin is a multi-time national champion here in the United States and I think also contender for Olympic selection for the past several Olympics. Uh, she was one of many elite athletes that came to the Telluride 100 this past summer. So um, March 2020, as we all know, COVID pretty much shut everything down and we saw events uh, making the decision to cancel right and left. And our first gut instinct was to go ahead and cancel. And then we later thought, rethought, um, there's a whole lot that we really don't know about it. What if it's all over by July, which is when our race was going to be held. So we postponed a go, no go decision until uh, May the 25th. So on May the 1st, as our deadline was approaching, we began working with uh, a lot of our local leaders, including the San Miguel County, Colorado Director of Public Health, Grace Franklin. Uh, and we came up with an operational plan that was basically based on uh, creating distancing and then also using sanitization and, and PPE in all aspects of our operation. So as far as distancing, we offered a full refund to all of our participants that had any COVID-19 symptoms or just didn't feel comfortable about racing. Uh, we ended up honoring 40 refunds, actually a little over 40 refunds, which really wasn't a big deal for us and that we had uh, a really long waiting list as our uh, race capacity was capped at 200 participants per our National Forest um, operating permit. Registration and waivers were all online with the exception of our COVID-19 symptom waiver, which we had emailed out to our participants and asked them to print and sign that and bring that back to packet uh, pickup. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later on. Um, our racer meeting was held online. Uh, normally in the past, we've done that in person. We scheduled our packet pickup with one racer coming through every minute as our uh, packet pickup process took approximately 30 seconds. So that prevented um, crowds and, and kept distancing uh, really, really good. 
Um, we seated our racers for the start in groups of 10 um, and we spaced them apart every six feet. Uh, and we did that from the fastest racer to the slowest racer. That way uh, from the very gun distancing was going to be created. And with a uh, hundred mile distance, it's already a very um, distanced race, uh, if you will, anyway, but we just wanted to do that from the, from the very start. Um, those waves uh, of 10 were done every 30 seconds. So we put 200 racers through in about a 10 minute span of time. Uh, our results were 100% done online. Uh, we didn't have any viewing area and that was to pre prevent crowds and uh, create distancing. And then we didn't have an award ceremony at all. We had an award pickup uh, and that was scheduled with each, um, each group every 10 minutes and the general public wasn't allowed to attend. Uh, we took a photo of each racer. They were standing on our podium uh, and then we made those available to everybody after the race for free. As far as PPE and sanitization, we did a temperature check prior to packet pickup. All of our volunteers and racers wore face coverings during packet pickup and during staging. Uh, face coverings could come off of racers 15, 15 seconds prior to the start. Um, all of our volunteers and staff wore face coverings at the feed stations everywhere, really, and uh, were required to wash and sanitize their hands frequently. Um, all of our feed stations had single serve, prepackaged items, and they were all spaced on tables six foot apart. So a racer would just come up, get what they needed, and then that item would be replenished. Uh, and then our tables were sanitized every 15 minutes. Um, lesson learned, I talked about the COVID-19 symptom waiver earlier. Uh, only about 10% of the racership ended up printing and signing those to bring those back. So that ended up um, making our registration process a little bit longer or packet pickup process a little bit longer than we had hoped. Um, one thing that we saw the Pikes Peak Apex do was uh, they had two volunteers and they had a COVID waiver that the racer would verbally agree to and the two volunteers were there were witnesses to uh, that racer verbally uh, agreeing to the COVID waiver. And then in the presentation yesterday with Bike Reg, um, they're going to have a, a waiver that you can send out uh, in advance uh, that racers would be allowed to agree to the COVID symptom waiver. Um, we will be putting one of those two best practices into place this coming summer. Um, and then as well, we've uh, consulted weekly with uh, the physician, Dr. Peter Craig here in San Miguel County, who does our contact tracing. We've had 800 positive cases here in our county. And so far zero have been transmitted in an outdoor environment. 100% have been uh, transmitted in an indoor environment. So we continue to feel really good about um, the opportunity to put on the race again this summer. Uh, other ideas, uh, Pikes Peak, Apex, uh, who I mentioned earlier, they also had a drive-through packet pickup, which worked really, really well. Uh, racers just came through. Actually, it was in the USAC headquarter parking lot. Um, racers drove through, told them their name. Uh, they grabbed the packet, handed up to them, and, and off and away they went. It was really, really fast, efficient, and, and very, very safe. At the very bottom of the bullet points, there's four articles, a Vela News article, Pink Bike, um, Telluride, our local newspaper here, and then as well, the Durango Herald. All of those are great um, articles that talk about uh, the race and then what we did for COVID. The Bella News has uh, commentary from Russell Finsterwall, who is our current uh, mountain bike marathon national champion, and Aaron Huck. Uh, and then uh, the Durango Herald article has some great dialogue from Riley Amos, who's one of our up and coming uh, stars in uh, endurance mountain bike racing, and uh, also Keegan Swinson. So um, at the very, very bottom, I included a PDF if you wanted to click that. That's this entire um, bullet point presentation, if you will. Also, the links to all of those articles, uh, feel free to read those at your leisure. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Tobin. So a question that um, I'd like each of you to answer, um, I'm, I'm hoping you have different methods of handling this. So how were protests handled at your events this year? Lance, do you wanna start? Fortunately, we didn't have any protests. I think we had <laughs> one out of all five races. And the fact that we kind of kept our timing trailer with our officials completely open air. Sometimes the officials actually parked their car right at the finish line. So they were isolated and they just, 
prepared to deal with any protests on a case by case basis. So the one that we had, the athlete did stay six feet away, made his case point, uh, officials conferred and dealt with it on the spot. One of the things that we did was all results were online as well. And uh, honestly, that was probably the best thing we did to help disperse the crowds after the race. Great, thanks. Joan, what did you all end up doing? Yeah, I mean, similar, I mean, literally the second the race, like the, the people finished their TT, their time was uploaded to, to tr live track timing. So they just checked their, their time on the, uh, on live track timing on their phones. Uh, I, I, Tom, I think we had one time where it was off, like, and we had to go to the hand timing, the official, we had officials doing uh, hand timing in addition to the, to the electronic timing at maybe once we had to back it up or check, but. Yeah, we had one, one, it was a weird situation, but he came to us and, and all the other times were right. His was a little gooped up. We researched it. We fixed it. Um, yeah. we, had a couple others where we had a, a pair of sisters that each started in, in the wrong, you know, they started as each other little things like that. But again, it was almost instantaneous. They checked it. They let us know. And, you know, we fixed it as quickly as we could. Yeah. So it was, it was actually easier to do it because they just looked on their phones and they didn't have to wait for us to go post the paper. They were able to do it like right away. So. Great. Thanks. And Tobin, what did you end up doing? We had uh, zero protests, but our plan was to have the racer approach the official at a six foot distance wearing face covering. Our official, of course, was wearing face covering as well. And then the official take that to the timing company to resolve any issue. Uh, fortunately, there was zero. And so um, just a follow up question, Joan, I know your numbers were relatively small due to regulations. So maybe Lance and Tobin with your larger scale events, um, let's say a rider just you know, left immediately after their race, were they given notification on when results were posted? And then was there a certain period of time in which you gave them to protest a result? I mean, one of the things that our athletes have kind of been used to over the years for at least the last six seasons is our results are live right after the race. Uh, obviously, they're not official till 15 minutes after the race, but as soon as they cross the finish line, they can pull out their phone and check their result. One of the things we did was typically over the years, any protest has come out of the podium positions. So we told the top five athletes, even though the podium was still top three, if you finish top five, you were allowed to kind of hang out at the venue. And that's where the one protest that we did have came from. It was for a podium position, like it usually is. Tobin, anything to add to that process? Sure. So uh, results were instantaneous. The really the moment the racer crossed the finish line, they were available online, and we encouraged racers to check them uh, immediately. We did have a protest period that was a part of our uh, pre-race uh, meeting. Uh, from one o'clock to one fifteen was the protest period for our fifty mile distance, and then uh, I believe six thirty to six forty five p.m. for our one hundred mile distance. And it was very clear to all racers that if they were going to raise a protest, they could do so before that time, but that would be our official protest window. And then after that, uh, we wouldn't hear protests. That said, uh, we were willing to, uh, to listen to anybody that had anything after that, but um, nothing came up at all. You all are lucky you don't operate events in Snowshoe, West Virginia or Missoula, Montana with your internet connectivity. <laughs> Um, all right, so next question. Um, what program or system are you using for digital waivers? And Joan, this was directed to you. Uh, yeah, we did all of it on Bike Reg um, because Bike Reg has the capacity to do the USAC waiver, but also um, you can upload additional waivers. And so we, we, used the bike, we use the Bike Reg platform for everything. Lance, um, Tobin, any other option for folks? We use Bike Ridge as well, and just because, like Joan said, you can add those additional waivers. One of the things we've done for the last two or three years in general is add an entry fee policy waiver, where athletes aren't just seeing your entry fee policy, whether it be no refunds or a credit, they're seeing it and they're initialing to it. So out of all the events we canceled last year, all 60 events, we didn't have a single chargeback or attempted chargeback with our credit card. 
Great, and um, this is a, a logistical question. So um, how are your official, officials set up? So are they on a stage? I know, Lance, you said some were in cars during you know this period of time, but uh, what setup worked for you to provide flow for the athletes and to maintain that social distancing? So at our finish line, we have a 23 foot trailer. It's usually with the timing crew. Our timing crew is usually two people. They slimmed down just to that one lead timer last year to kind of create more space in the trailer. And then we left it up to the officials. Some of the officials were completely comfortable, the two chief judges and assistant judge being in the trailer with the timing crew because it is so large. But other times, depending on the weather, they stayed in their cars, isolated, and just had radio communication with the timing crew. Both seem to work pretty well. Okay. Governor Joan, any, any additional information from your event? Sure, we had um, two 10 by 10 tents on each side of the finish line with one official in each one of those tents. So they were very distant from each other. And then uh, another official that was um, mobile and just walking around the entire finish area, um, staying distance from all racers. And then as well, um, just helping kind of direct people where they needed to go after the finish and things like that. And for us, the having Tom doing this, the electronic timing um, meant that we needed fewer officials um, because normally we would have officials hand scoring um, and they'd be up on the, the judges stand essentially, you know, hand scoring the event. But because we had Tom doing electronic scoring, uh, we needed fewer officials um, so they didn't have to be sort of jammed in the viewing stand. Uh, so we then ended up putting one on the bell, like the lap, the lap bell, and then we had another one at the start line. So we just spread out those positions so that they, they didn't have to all be squished together on the judging stand because we had the addition of the electronic timing. And did you all place your chief referee in a certain location for protests? Uh, if, you know, I know you had limited ones, but um, where were they posted and um, did they stay in the tent? Did they stay in the trailer, Lance? Our, ours are always by the finish trailer. I mean, that's where athletes always kind of know that the chief referee is roaming around. We always try to keep our start area in proximity and viewing site of the finish line, if at all possible. Because that's okay. typically where the chief referee will float back and forth between. Okay. Um, and I'm going to throw a question that we asked Dr. Rashawn and Chuck earlier. Um, how you, you, some of you touched upon this, like Joan, you talked about all of your signage at the venue, kind of directing athletes in which process they should be doing things. And I think this lends to it. Um, what were your pre-event or pre-training time communications to help riders or racers feel comfortable attending your event or training sessions? So we had, we had it really highly detailed on our website. Um, so it was super detailed on, on the website and there was a banner on literally every page. So if you were signing up for peewees and squirts, there was a big red banner on the top of the page that said, read the latest COVID updates. Uh, so we were hyper communicative on the website, but then we also had a pretty aggressive social campaign so that we pushed out through our social channels what the policies were gonna be. And then we reinforced that messaging again on Bike Reg. So when you registered for the thing, you got the same set of, of regulations again. So the message was highly visible on multiple platforms. Um, and then you could not, and even now the signage is still up, although buried under 30 inches of snow, you could not show up at the venue and not know where you were supposed to go. Um, again, giving a big nod to Kelly, like there were big yellow arrows like this way and a signage plan that you could, like a directional signage plan that you could not possibly misunderstand, right? It was a, it was, it was incredibly like, you must go here, stop here. Like it was so mapped out that you could not, you could not miss it. Um, you know, from the moment you pulled into the parking lot, it was like park here, drop off here for the kids program even. We had parents drop off here, parents pick up here. Like there was, so, there was so much signage, it was ridiculous, um, but it worked and, and people didn't get confused. So that's how we communicated it, but it was multi-platform. I mean, for us, it was very similar. So we had our COVID mitigation guide on each event website, but then once all the athletes pre-registered, everyone got an individualized email, not only with that guide, because not everyone's going to go through an eight-page PDF guide, 
but in the newsletter, it had all the bulleted points of what their experience was going to look like from the time they arrived at the venue to the time they left the venue. And I think one important thing that I didn't talk about earlier that worked well for us was we weren't the only races that took place in Colorado. There were two other cyclocross races actually in Castle Rock. And I think it's hugely important just to work with the other race directors in your community. So even though those races, that particular county wasn't under the same restrictions as we were for a lot of our venues, he adopted the same exact guidelines for consistency and that continuity with the racer. That way they weren't bouncing between races in Colorado, expecting different rules or different restrictions. We're all operated kind of as a team in tandem, which really has never happened before. Great point, great point, Lance. Tobin, anything to add? Yeah, so the, it's been mentioned, the frequent communication, uh, the moment that the racer registered an email goes out to them with a, a plethora of information and then an email updates after that. And then the other big thing I think for us was um, offering that full refund, no questions asked if they had COVID symptoms or if they just didn't feel comfortable racing. Um, that helped a tremendous amount. Great, and um, I'm not gonna try and pronounce Art Boland's question in the chat, um, but for we have five minutes. Um, so one last question for you all. Um, we talked earlier about uh, whether, you know, there needed to be certain HIPAA restrictions if you were gonna ask folks for vaccination records, um, whether they've had COVID but now are negative. Um, do each of you plan to alter your protocol based on the fact that people are getting vaccines. Um, we have, you know, research saying that there is some immunity after a positive COVID test. If each of you could talk to, to that and what your protocol changes might be because of it. Lance, go ahead, since you started yeah, us I guess off. I'll tackle it first. I mean, right now, a lot of the conversations we're having are the guidelines from the Colorado Department of Public Health are changing so quickly. Even though I'm having for many conversations now for April and May events, our goal is to have things dialed in at a 30 day mark. So by mid March to kind of know what things look like because things are so fluid and changing. And right now we're not planning to change anything that worked well from last year. So the biggest thing that a lot of our conversations are is the population we're dealing with it is, I don't wanna say a more responsible population, but it's a very different population than those attending a concert. So what worked well last year, we're hoping carries through unless things drastically change. Joan? Um, I, yeah, I think we're, we're under, I think we're feeling the pressure from our community to try to bring back Mass Start Racing. Um, so obviously we're gonna be super dependent on what the, the governor's mandate says, uh, but, and I was really happy to hear Chuck address it, um, Certainly, when we put on our UCI events, we're going to have to be compliant with what the UCI requirements are for UCI guidelines, um, and also what the guidelines are for international travel. Um, so we're looking at all of that, right? So if if the UCI comes out and says, you know, by July you've got to be able to provide proof of vaccination, then for our UCI events, we'll have to do that. Um, so we're we're much like Lance. We're sort of in that, and everything's on the table. Uh, but we're sort of waiting to see where we land a little bit closer to it. I do think um, certainly for athletes traveling domestically from within the US, uh, I think it would be very realistic for us to ask for proof of a, of a negative COVID test or, um, or a, a, a documentation that they've recovered. Um, so I suspect that something along those lines will be in order if we do go back to mass start racing. Uh, it's just a question of, of you know, where do we fall with the mask mandate? Great, thanks, Tobin. So at, at this point, our plan is to not ask for those two uh, pieces of data. Um, we have received all of the information from UCI. Telluride 100 will be a UCI XCM uh, this coming summer. And so far with the information I've received from the UCI, I've not found any information where they are asking us to grab that information from racers. Um, one thing that we are considering, uh, we found uh, rapid PCR tests um, that you can have results in 45 minutes or less uh, for like $18. And we're considering purchasing those for our elite field and that we will be having a mass start with all of our elite racers. For our start for our amateur racers, we're planning to do the same thing. Um, small group start, either 10 or 20 spaced uh, six feet apart. 
um, to create distancing. And then as well, continue to seed those groups from fastest to slowest racers to minimize passing. Great, thanks everybody. And um, one thing for those who are running international UCI and scripted races, the USOPC, so the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee, they do have a government relations group that does work on international travel, both for our athletes going abroad and for domestic international events. So if if you need help with any, with any travel stuff, getting your athletes over here, um, please let me know and I can point you in the right direction to to my contact with the USOPC on that. Um, thank Sarah, you. Let me, sorry, let me add oh, into ahead. that as well. We have, uh, we have worked with a lot of our teams. As a matter of fact, I just got an email during this webinar from a team traveling overseas. If any of your athletes do need permission information from us that they're attending an event or uh, are traveling overseas, uh, we have some templates we can use for that. And we do them all the time. So don't feel afraid to reach out. 